This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens to start a trade just upon us for Japan and South Korea. But Paul, it's not just uh, the focus on equities today because we are having that watch on central banks and we do have Singapore about to, to put out its first policy decision under the new managing director. That's right. Um, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore now doing uh, quarterly meetings, but we're not really expecting any change today. We'll uh, have that decision imminently. Uh, one area where we're seeing a lot of movement at the moment, though, is very much uh, in the oil space uh, on the uh, increasing tensions in the Middle East and energy stocks really catching a bid today. Yeah, it's only going to be a sector to, to watch and, and track that demand that we're seeing coming through for Havens this morning. But we're just getting that MAS decision here. Uh, no change coming through to the width and the centre of the currency band. Uh, we've also got the MAS saying that it's going to maintain the prevailing slate, slope of the policy band, uh, seeing core inflation as well at 2.5 to 3.5 per cent over the course of this year. So let's get more on this decision now. As we said, it is the first policy decision decision we have under the new managing director Chia De Jun who replaced Ravi Menon in January. Avril Hong is joining us now from Singapore uh, for more on this. So Avril, just talk us through the headline and the readout on it so far. Yeah, guys, I think nobody was expecting a change in monetary policy from the MAS at the first of its four decisions this year, up from twice a year. And this is, you know, on the back of all 19 economists pretty much expecting it to stand pat. Uh, but there are upside risks to inflation. And if you take a look at the core number, for example, in December, that actually surprised and defied expectations of a deceleration. Uh, so these upside risks and given how core inflation is still elevated is going to be something that we're watching very keenly and in fact we are expecting or uh, looking out for clues on where inflation is going to tread this year how surely the MAS expects it uh, these price pressures to come down whether it's because of declines in import price pressures or whether it's because of the relative loosening of a currently tight labor market uh, so these are some of the factors that we'll be keeping in mind. And of course, today we are also getting that reminder of some of the upside risks to inflation, uh, the violence in the Middle East, how that's going to play out in oil prices, how is that going to affect shipping rates. And domestically as well, uh, there are some concerns. If you take a look at the GDP print for the fourth quarter of last year, that surprised to the upside. And as I say, the labor market is still relatively tight. We also had a GST tax hike that kicked in at the start of this year. So there are all these factors at play that could uh, pose upside risk to inflation going forward, hence the need to keep things restrictive. But again, as I say, no change for now. Yeah, the uh, GST sales tax going up from 8 to 9% uh, at the start of the year, as you mentioned there. Uh, we've also got the Monetary Authority of Singapore saying it sees growth uh, for 2024 between 1 to 3%. Uh, what are the risks around this number? Yeah, we actually saw that GDP print coming through in the fourth quarter of last year because of the pickup in manufacturing and construction. And manufacturing is expected to continue rebounding this year. So that could mean more of a balanced recovery when the revenge spending for the services sector starts easing off. We're also expecting some tourism arrivals in China to improve, especially given the visa-free arrangement uh, that kicks in next month. But to your question about the risks for growth, they abound. Uh, whether you're talking about China or the two hot wars, uh, these are all factors that could prove to be headwinds uh, and could make the external environment less favorable for Singapore, especially given how trade dependent it is. GDP this year is really going to depend on the recovery of global trade. That was uh, Avril Hong there in Singapore. And just as we were getting that as well, another redhead crossing the terminal here. The MAS seeing core inflation to step down by the fourth quarter of this year and then as well to, to fall further over the course of 2025. But the MAS uh, sticking with its moderately restrictive stance in its first decision of the year. And you can get more details, of course, on the, this decision in the Tea Live blog that's underway right now. Uh, let's change, though, because we just had the market opens for Japan and Korea. So we've got the start of the day here. 
you can see uh, the Nikkei is just moving a little bit higher so far, perhaps supported in part by that Japan currency weakness you're continuing to see, so holding at that 148 mark. But the Nikkei here, the topics, both of those in green territory. Earnings is really the one to be watching over the course of this week, and we've got major lenders that are going to be releasing their numbers that focus on, on the BOJ policy settings and what that will mean for their net interest margins moving forward. The other sort of big theme that we're watching in the session so far is that demand that's coming through for certain havens this morning after the U.S. says that three of its service troops were killed over the weekend uh, by Iran-backed militants, rather, so there are those concerns of escalation around the Middle East region. Uh, that is also one of the key themes we're tracking in Korean markets today because we actually had North Korea, if you change on now, uh, testing new cruise missiles at the weekend and uh, we did actually see the leader, Kim, overseeing the launch. So certainly uh, ramping up the rhetoric about a potential conflict with the US and also South Korea. So we can watch those defence stocks, how they're trading so far. But broadly, we are seeing a little bit of gains coming across for equities. And Paul, that's, that's partly due to what happened in the US session, a little bit lower to close the week, but still higher over the past five sessions. Yeah, let's see how we're doing here in Australia, of course, returning after a three-day weekend. The ASX currently flat, but of course, uh, one sector that is performing well uh, is energy, better by 1.4% right now. And we have seen uh, crude prices rising. You see Brent crude there, uh, better by 1% at the moment. Of course, we, we did have that attack, as we've been discussing, on U.S. troops. Also, though, Houthi rebels hitting a tanker that carrying Russian oil. And this is after previously saying the Houthis would only target vessels with Iranian connections. Hmm. The Aussie dollar, meanwhile, are still stuck there, just below 66 cents US. Uh, you mentioned haven demand, so let's take a look at how we're doing in the Treasury space. Interestingly enough, not a great deal of movement there in the Tokyo session yet. The uh, yield on the 10-year, in fact, unchanged uh, from where we left it at the close in the US, 4.1373, and not a great deal of change across the curve in Treasuries, in fact. Well, China is set to halt the lending of certain shares for short selling from Monday. And this is, of course, in a move to support the country's slumping stock markets. Let's get some more on that move with Homan Lee, senior macro strategist at Lombard ODA, joining us now from our Singapore studio. Uh, so, Homan, a ban on short selling, what's this going to do to help with stability or perhaps hinder price discovery? Well, um, we've seen this kind of uh, move before uh, by the Chinese authorities. Uh, uh, certainly, this is reminiscent of a raft of measures that were adopted by uh, Beijing uh, during the 2015 uh, stock market volatility. Um, uh, it's possible that given the sell-off that has taken place in the market so far, uh, possibly partly due to uh, technical factors like the structure products in South Korea or you know derivative uh, used by investors in China and maybe liquidation of some hedge funds so the very poor sentiment leading to this uh, could potentially open the door for some technical rebound but uh, in terms of the ability of these measures to really change the market sentiment we are slightly more cautious uh, because what's really needed is a change in the uh, inflation outlook for the country and the overall sentiment in the private sector. And f for this, the measures might not be enough. Uh, but as for the technical rebound possibility, maybe these measures could help just a bit. Um, uh, so that's kind of how we are reading uh, these measures right now. Yeah, uh, we have, of course, uh, had signal of that triple R cut, a number of other measures as well. We did see the CSI and the Hang Seng Index move a little bit higher, although they closed the week slightly weaker. What's the trend from here? And you did mention that those measures aren't enough to achieve the goals. What, what measures would you like to see from Chinese policymakers? So our view here is that the policy has been very reactive um, and, and not uh, preemptive. Uh, you know, so far, all the measures that have been adopted, you could e easily imagine you know, what could happen if they were adopted much earlier. Um, and uh, the cut in triple R, of course, it's much better than nothing. Um, uh, and I think uh, the, the move by the PBOC 
uh, reduce uh, some of the, the, the negative sentiment that resulted from the lack of action on interest rate uh, you know, earlier uh, this month. Uh, so these measures uh, by themselves uh, could help at the margin. But when we say you know, we don't see the uh, you know, credible reflationary package yet, um, what we're trying to say here is that the, the private sector sentiment um, requires firmer action on, on both monetary policy and fiscal policy, especially because the authorities have decided to pledge to um, a stable renminbi. So, so you know, for the proper reflation uh, package to be delivered, uh, they need to be even more aggressive on the monetary policy side. And you know, I think this is one of the reasons why they brought out the, the pledge supplementary lending uh, for the three big projects in Tier 1 cities. But we still don't have a convincing uh, details for these measures yet, um, uh, at least the details that are similar to what they tried in 2015-17 property market uh, uh, downturn. And on the fiscal front, um, uh, yes, uh, the authorities are increasing the deficit targets a little bit. But keep in mind that uh, you know, they do have uh, you know, significant constraints for the local governments due to worries about hidden debt. So as a result, um, we really don't see a meaningful um, rise in the, the augmented fiscal deficit this year compared to last year. And again, um, you know, the, the cautious approach, I, we fully understand why uh, they're taking this step. But given the challenges in the economy, um, they definitely need to do more. Um, and for, for sure, if you look at the sentiment data for households and businesses, uh, you know, all the measures that have been adopted so far, not getting the job done yet. And is that sort of support going to be something that you think really substantially helps ASEAN over the course of this year? Or do you think the bigger driver is really going to be those expectations around what the Fed does and the potential for cuts? So China, uh, we expect China's growth to slow down a little bit this year compared to last year. Um, the, the comparison base is no longer that favorable. And even if they have get, you know, even if they have a bit of stabilization in the property sector, uh, very difficult to see how uh, they can achieve uh, significantly above 5% growth in 2024. So that's a bit of setback for um, uh, you know, ASEAN economies, especially you know, Thailand and Malaysia uh, to a degree. But at the same time, these are more locally driven economies. They still have some room to catch up with the other uh, more developed uh, you know, economies around them. And uh, you know, the cut in interest rates by key central banks and the weakening pressure on currency definitely helps because they need to invest more. And when the foreign capital uh, start to coming in again, start to come in again, I think uh, these economies in a better position. And of course, the markets, uh, you know, went through a bit of uh, um, uh, weakness last year. Um, so the valuation for these markets are no longer that challenging. So in our view, uh, you know, ASEAN markets uh, are pretty well positioned for a bit of recovery this year. And we think the global market uh, macro context is supportive, despite a bit of setback uh, from China. I can see you've got some views here on on the Singapore MAS. We just had, of course, the MAS putting out its decision, leaving its policy settings in place. Uh, was that what you were expecting? And, and what is your outlook for, for policy in Singapore over the course of this year? Uh, so for us, uh, this was more or less a foregone conclusion. Uh, we had a bit of upside surprise in the fourth quarter uh, GDP. Uh, despite a bit of volatility from pharmaceutical sector uh, during that quarter. So that's a sign that the underlying growth is rebounding very nicely, uh, especially with some help from the high-tech segment, uh, including semiconductor. And also, uh, we had that inflation surprise. Usually, when you have the domestic input prices falling with a bit of you know, maybe four to five month lag, uh, you, you see that uh, move being copied uh, for the domestic inflation. But that's not what we, that's not what, what we saw in December series. Uh, so with the GST being hiked and uh, you know, the, the carbon tax being implemented uh, in the medium term and the wage growth is supported by the government, uh, we think uh, it makes sense for the you know, monetary authority of Singapore to be cautious. And we don't see any change in the remainder of the year. The setting uh, right now uh, probably makes sense, especially because the economy is set to deliver uh, 2 plus percent growth uh, this year, uh, roughly double the pace last year. So in our view, uh, keeping the policy setting unchanged, uh, it seems appropriate for uh, MAS. And it, it's a bit of a departure from what the other Asian central banks will do in the second half of this year. 
Coleman Lee, that was our senior macro strategist at Lombard Odia joining us. And you can tune into Bloomberg for more on the MAS decision. Go to T Live, go to get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert, expert editors, rather. That blog uh, is underway right now. Let's uh, take a look, though, at some of the movers that we're tracking so far in the session because we're just under 15 minutes into trade so far. And one of the groups of stocks that we're tracking in particular are the defense names here that are listed in Korea and Japan because we saw North Korea testing what it's billing as newly developed cruise missiles for use in submarines at the weekend. We also had the leader, Kim Jong-un, overseeing the launch. Uh, so certainly it's, it's just another signal of that ramping up that we're seeing in tensions, the risk of a possible conflict with the US and South Korea. And you are seeing some of those names here moving higher. Uh, geopolitical tensions, we are continuing to track those in the Middle East, of course. And the big story over the weekend was the U.S. saying that three of its troops have been killed by an Iran-backed group. Uh, the U.S. as well vowing retaliation off that. And so we have seen energy moving higher. We are seeing energy linked names that are moving as well. So I have more on that story and the fears of any sort of possible escalation off the back. Uh, just ahead, this is Bloomberg. Let's check one commodity that's been moving today. That is oil. Moves higher for both Brent crude and New York crude. Better by about 1% at the moment. And this is, of course, off the back of an attack on U.S. troops in the Middle East. Uh, let's get some more on that now. President Biden vowing retaliation after that attack tied to Iran-backed groups killed three U.S. troops, wounded 25 others. This happened in Jordan near the Syrian border. Uh, Bloomberg's Michael Heath has been following this story. He joins us now. So President Biden promising retaliation, uh, but how measured will he have to be in his response? Yeah, very measured, I think, Paul. I mean, he's really got to strike a balance because he wants to, to send a signal of deterrence because obviously um, these Iran-backed proxies are, are working all over the region. Um, it's almost like pop-up problems that, that the U.S. is facing there. Um, and particularly, these are the first U.S. troops that have died since the, um, since the conflict between Israel and Hamas has began. So it's a pretty significant issue. 20, uh, Sorry, pretty, pretty significant event. 25 um, U.S. servicemen injured as well. So he, he will want to send a signal. Now, some of the things that have been raised is perhaps a, um, a raid into Iran that, that where nobody takes any, any responsibility or an attempt to assassinate an official like um, President Trump did in 2020. Um, so th there's options there. But by the same token, he doesn't want to get embroiled in, in a face-off with Iran. He's made it very clear that uh, the U.S. doesn't want to get uh, sucked into a regional conflict. Remember, President President Biden pulled U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, so he knows what the risks are there. But they, they do need to send some sort of signal of deterrence to Iran there, and it's going to be very, very interesting what they choose, to, how they calibrate it, and what they choose to, to use to send that signal. That's sort of against the backdrop as well of, of for any sort of hopes for a hostage deal. We have that potentially in the works at the same time that Netanyahu is still sticking with that, that stated goal of eliminating uh, Hamas as well. Yeah, Annabelle, it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. That there, there does seem to be movement there. Um, the heads of the intelligence, um, heads of intelligence from countries including the U.S., uh, Israel, um, and uh, Egypt, as well as uh, Qatar's prime minister, uh, were meeting in Paris, and uh, the discussion is over a, a potential two-month pause that would see the hostages released. Now, why two months? The idea is that it, it sort of strikes a middle ground between um, Hamas, which has said that it won't um, release hostages until the, the end of the, the conflict, and Israel, which has said that um, it refuses to end the conflict until Hamas is destroyed. Two months gives sort of the potential length of time to, to allow some sort of diplomatic negotiation to go on, and certainly to get aid in there and all sorts of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, but, but it gives it a, a rare opportunity to try to get these hostages out. The, the pressure on the Israeli government has been building uh, on the hostages. Now, um, the, the Netanyahu obviously has a very, very right-wing and nationalistic government. He needs to deal 
deal with. So he, he's sort of trying to strike a balance here as well uh, between, the, between the demands of the, uh, of the hostage families. That was uh, Bloomberg's Michael Heath there in Sydney. And you can get a roundup of the stories you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. That's available for Bloomberg subscribers on the Day B Go function on their terminals. You can also get it on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can also customise your settings so you only get the news on industries and assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. Well, we just got the first decision by the Monetary Authority of Singapore since it switched to quarterly meetings and the departure of its long-running chief, Ravi Menon. And the MAS left policy settings unchanged, sees core inflation declining by the fourth quarter, and there's a whole slew of central bank decisions due around the world this week. The Fed going to be making its first decision of 2024 on Wednesday. Bloomberg Economics says while the FOMC will hold this week, the stage is set for a cut at the March meeting. Well, Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed Al Aryan says the U.S. central bank's job isn't over yet, even as inflation begins to ease. He spoke on Bloomberg surveillance. We are in the sweetest spot of the inflation reduction right now. It's going to get tougher going forward. And we've already seen from Europe that it's not out of the question that not only does inflation stabilize, but once in a while you get the rate going up. And that would really impact perceptions. The White House is so excited to lean into this, Mohammed, soft, very soft landing expectation. The timeline may be on their side, but when you look out to November, where are the vulnerabilities to that soft landing? So the vulnerability, of, uh, that's three of them. One is what the external world is imposing on the U.S. It is getting harder to grow in this, in this global environment. We have disruptions of supply chains. We have cost pressures in the pipeline. We have delays in shipments. All of that has a marginal impact. Two, the consumer is going to be under more pressure. You've talked about debt levels in, in the previous hour. Savings have come down. We no longer have the pandemic savings being utilized to the extent it was before. So there's a real risk that growth slows to the one to one and a half percent level with downside that we may slip into a negative quarter. And then thirdly, inflation. We need inflation to keep on going down. The, mar the market expects that it will do so in a much more orderly way than I think will materialize, unfortunately. The Deutsche Bank says we'll get a reality check later this year. They're looking for, say, 10 percent downside on the S&P 500. It's not particularly unusual. Are you expecting that kind of reality check, Mohammed, anytime soon for markets, given where stocks are at all time highs, spreads, global credit spreads, incredibly tight? You know, John, I, I'm, I'm not in the business of predicting um, whether it happens and when it happens um, and where people have been wrong in the past, including last year, is ignoring the technicals. And the technicals right now are incredibly favorable. So the, the big question for me is what breaks favorable technical? By that, I mean there's still money in the sideline that can be put to work. So dips will be viewed as buying opportunities for a while. Look, John, the thing I worry about most is the sense that growth is going to disappoint with a downward risk, the balance of risk on the downside. This comes against the universal romance with the softest of all soft landing. And then secondly, a recognition that the Fed is not going to validate what's being priced in right now in terms of cuts. When's that first rate cut coming, Mohammed? My, my own gut feeling is that it will come in the beginning of the summer. So call it June, maybe July. And it will be 25 basis points. And not only do I think that that's what's going to happen, I think that that's what should happen. That was Bloomberg opinion columnist Mohamed El Arian speaking with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern and Jonathan Frero. Uh, coming up, we'll have the debt-laden property developer China Evergrande facing a renewed risk of liquidation in a court in Hong Kong. You can see those live pictures there, those court proceedings, that hearing kicking off in just over one hour from now. This is Bloomberg.
watching Daybreak Asia and taking you to some live pictures of the court in Hong Kong where Evergrande's fate is going to be decided in just over an hour's time from now. So it's going to be once again trying to, to fend off liquidation. We've seen a decision on possible liquidation already deferred a couple of times before. But the, the judge overseeing the case, Linda Chan, making it clear that those chances for reprieve are over and the decision really is due. So the focus on, on Evergrande's restructuring plan, the progress as well that it's making with key creditors here. So let's get more on this and bring in our bond and loan reporter, Loretta Chen. So, uh, so much anticipation around this later today. What exactly are you expecting to hear later? Yeah, so today is really the so-called last chance for Evergrande to avoid that liquidation. Uh, we're expecting Linda Chan and also Evergrande's creditor to lay out any sort of progress that it's been made in the last month. So the last time Evergrande had the hearing was in December, and then it was a surprise turn of the event because uh, one of the key creditors pressing the wind-up order decided not to go ahead with winding up. But at the same time, we're hearing from other creditor groups that they may they replace that original creditor top shine, so chances are still high that they're going to press their case. So how likely is it that Evergrande uh, faces liquidation and what's that going to mean for the broader property sector in China? Yeah, so liquidation risk is very, very high at this moment. We haven't heard any concrete progress from creditors and Evergrande uh, in the past months. And we understand that this will be the key factor deciding Judge Linda Chan's decision. So if Evergrande's ever liquidated, I think the first impact will be on sentiment. You will see property stocks continue to go on their downward spiral. And on the other hand, for other property companies, they may see other creditors uh, pressing on their claim because they see that actually, uh, you know, creditors can get that liquidation realized in the Hong Kong court. So it could mean more liquidation coming up for China's property companies. It's not just the hearing that takes place at 9.30 a.m. local time, so just a one hour from now. There's also the second hearing that's scheduled for today, the, the so-called regulating order that comes around 2.30 p.m. So what exactly is happening in that time of the day. Yeah, that's right. That hearing will be contingent upon what kind of decision comes out of the 9.30 hearing. So if Evergrande gets a liquidation order, then the 2.30 hearing, we're expecting to hear Linda Chen appointing a, a liquidator in that hearing. Mm -hmm. All right, that was our, our bond and loan reporter, Loretta Chen, and certainly counting down to that key decision in just over an hour's time from now. But let's get more perspective on what this means for China's property market and its financial sector in general. Joining us is Xu Jin Chen, head of China Financial and Property Research at Jeffrey. So we just heard there from Loretta that if we do get a winding up order today, the first impact could be to sentiment. But is that your view as well? Yes, I do agree with that. Uh, but however, regarding to the equity market, we found that most investors are already see uh, a few liquidation cases before. Uh, so they are relative. Uh, they they think the like uh, another potential liquidation, uh, the uh, marginal impact should be like moderate this time. Then, if we do get it though, because I'm, I'm interested, yeah, if you say it's going to be moderate, for the everyday Chinese property buyer in China, are they so concerned about the, the outcome of this court decision today? I would say that it will, uh, it will impact the overall sentiment uh, for the uh, house purchase in China. So actually, uh, uh, in the past one year, we see like China government has conducted quite a lot of uh, to ensure the housing delivery. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's also the case that this year, uh, if there is a potential liquidation and uh, uh, when investors are trying to uh, purchase houses developed by private developers, uh, they will be much more careful. Uh, and uh, the, the those like measurements to ensure housing delivery will, will be more important in future. The policies that we've seen so far really have been on curbing contagion risks from the likes of China Evergrande. We haven't seen, though, as much really on sort of these policies to try and boost demand for properties. 
Yes, we agree with that. Uh, so actually, we think that for this year, if China can utilize the uh, the money from, for example, PSL and also a special government uh, a special government bond, and using them to put uh, demand, uh, for example, to purchasing a vacant house and transfer them into affordable housing, that will be very helpful uh, to boost the demand. But currently, we see that the overall scale of uh, potential PSL is not that significant, uh, and also. Uh, the, uh, the the money from the PSR are not only used to like boost the, the property market, but also used to uh, bo uh, used to help the infrastructure, and even for the property sector. Uh, we think currently measurements is to uh, um, help both uh, the supply and demand, which may which may not necessary enough to boost the demand to uh, to change the market expectation about future price. Yeah, how affordable is uh, residential property in China's major cities at the moment, and where do you see the price heading? Uh, we actually expect the price to uh, decline faster in the first half this year. Uh, the problem is that in the past, uh, like tier one cities, they see a uh, they see a gap between the primary market price and the secondary market price. The secondary market is usually higher, uh, but it, the gap has largely narrowed in the past one year. Uh, so there's not not too much support for the primary market uh, price from the secondary this year. And the second is that last year we see quite a lot of uh, I would say that most of projects uh, launched was uh, mainly in the center, city center rather than remote area. Uh, so that, that helps with last year. Again, not too much help for this year. And the third is that uh, we see like more, more property for sale uh, from either the foreclosure, more foreclosure, and also from uh, those um, uh, creditors of developers. Uh, in the past two years, uh, the developers have transferred quite a lot of houses to their creditors uh, as the payment for the uh, for the debts. So these houses would be also uh, like uh, would be also sold in the market. Uh, therefore, also uh, results in an impact to the to the overall market to the uh, primary market price. So actually, in the uh, first half this year, yeah, we see a higher pressure for uh, yeah. primary market price. Yeah, well, longer term, there's there's a bigger issue looming as well, and that is demographics. We have, of course, seen China's population contract very modestly, but for a second year in a row. Is there a much deeper structural issue that's going to have to be addressed here? I would say that the structural uh, problem, especially from the population, the lower marriage ratio, the lower birth ratio, will continue in the next three years. Uh, so it, during these period, uh, the uh, the demand for house first house will continue to decline. So it largely depends on whether people can change their sentiment, change their expectation of the uh, property price. Uh, if they can, if there is a change or stabilizing the property price, then we would see some increase in the upgrade demand. Otherwise. Uh, I would say that property market will continue to decline in terms of sales. And then, uh, really, uh, one of the, the, the knock-on effects of that comes down to the expectations around what we see for the financial sector, the banks in China. So perhaps if they're being told that they need to continue to position to serve the real economy in China, that presents a risk as well. Uh, so first is that we do see rising risk for regional banks this year, uh, especially for banks, for example, in northeastern China and uh, like western China and some of middle China. So these places we see the property market decline decline more, which may have more impact to the uh, to the banks uh, to the related banks, especially some regional banks. Uh, and second is that we also notice that large banks uh, they are seeing this kind of risk as well. Uh, so if you look at like a, a three month Schreiber, it actually increased a little bit in the past several months, despite a lot of liquidity injected uh, from PBOC. So that will also uh, increase the risk for uh, liquidity risk for uh, small regional banks as well. Uh, so first is that we do see like rising risk for uh, regional banks. And second is that because uh, China banks, they haven't, um, uh, I mean, as long as the projection is uh, continued, um, not suspended, then they are not recognized as NPR at this moment. Uh, so for most of the banks, they are trying to like extend loans to uh, property developers uh, in order to uh, ease their liquidity. That help with the overall uh, uh, sector and uh, property market at this moment. Uh, but, uh, but we see like rising risk in future as well. 
All right, Xi Chen, head of China Financial and Property Research at Jefferies. Thanks so much for joining us. Now you can watch us live and you can see our past interviews as well on our interactive TV function, TV Go. And there you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions that we talk about. You can also become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. You can check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Just about 40 minutes into the session so far for trading in Japan and Korea this morning and looking at what we've got on the GMM function so far, look, it's pretty muted. There's not too much activity that we're seeing. And when you take a look at, for instance, in the bond space, yields looking a little bit mixed so far. Uh, currencies as well, just a bit of dollar strength that's coming through. In the commodity space, though, you do have the likes of iron ore that's higher, aluminium as well. But energy broadly is the sector we're tracking quite closely, given the moves in oil this morning and that is rising off those heightened tensions in the Middle East and, and the threats that that's bringing to global trade. Equities wise, it's going to be a very key week in terms of central banks. We had the MAS policy statement earlier this hour, but really it's coming down to the Fed and, and the signaling that we get on the outlook for rate cuts over the course of this year as well earnings to note. So we have a lot of the MAG7, for instance, in the US on Wall Street. But here in Asia, we're actually gearing up for the busiest period this earnings season. And uh, chief among those that are going to be tracking is Japan's top lenders because they're due to report numbers this week. That's after the BOJ governor, Kazueda, left little doubt that an increase of the world's last negative interest rate is in the pipeline. Bloomberg's breaking news editor, Gareth Allen, joins us now in Tokyo. And uh, Gareth, just kick us off with what we're expecting exactly from from the banks yeah, that's right. So we've got uh, two of Japan's three mega banks reporting this week with Sumitomo Mitsui on Thursday, followed by Mizuho on Friday. And if you dig into the uh, the analyst estimates, you can see that generally uh, lending profit, fee income, the core operations have been relatively solid. They're looking to inch up a couple of percentage points uh, in the third quarter. But trading has been a, been an issue. Uh, trading has, has pulled down profit. Uh, uh, so we're expecting that uh, net income will be lower year on year in the third quarter. That said, both of those two banks Banks raised their full year forecasts last quarter, uh, and they'd be tra if they meet estimates, they've been tracking well into the 80% zone uh, of their uh, progress against their full year forecasts. So it's looking relatively re relatively po positive at this stage for the, for the two banks. Oh, Gareth, we've also got Japan's biggest brokerage, Nomura, reporting earnings as well this week. How's their performance looking? Yep, we'll be third quarter again for uh, for Nomura. Uh, full year forecasts, uh, the analyst estimates looking that they're going to break uh, three consecutive years of declining profit. They're tracking to be up uh, nearly 60% uh, for the full year. So we'll get a, a view on how they're progressing against that in the third quarter. Uh, in watching, in terms of what we're looking at, um, their new focus on investment management, they've said that they're looking to uh, have 100 billion yen in uh, pre-tax profit by 2030 in that uh, in that sector, and they're still trying to cut costs in their wholesale uh, banking as well, which has been a bit behind. So uh, we're looking for progress on both of those uh, both of those areas. Just we had that chart just there, taking a look at, at the moves we've had in Japanese lenders over the course of this year, and it has been that trend high for them. How much is that around the anticipation of what the BOJ does with its policy? Yeah, that's that's all. That's all about the the BOJ. I mean, really, that that is the the underlying thing that is that is really uh, important for Japan's financial sector at the moment. Of course, the Bank of Japan stood pat last week at their uh, at their policy meeting uh, with uh, uncertainty around what the uh, the earthquake, uh, how the, how that's going to impact the economy, and also uh, heading to into the spring when wage talks will come out and and how how solid the wage growth is going to be. Um, but the expectations at this point is that certainly in the first half of this year, the BOJ is likely to move. Uh, to reverse that negative interest rate policy, the last one in the world, in the world as you said uh, just before. And that is going to be nothing but positive for uh, the financial sector. And as uh, analysts have said, that uh, uh, the Nomura banking analyst, uh, 
uh, has said that that's uh, supporting his bullish stance uh, on the the bank sector. So, um, you know, when negative interest rates grow, interest rates going to come up, gives banks more room to uh, uh, to make larger margins on their lending business. So, um, yeah, nothing but good, and that's reflected in the share prices. All right, breaking news editor Gareth Allen in Tokyo. Other corporate stories that we're tracking today. Bloomberg has learned that Reddit is being advised to consider a valuation of at least $5 billion in its IPO. Sources say that's the view from early meetings with potential investors. Private trades of Reddit's unlisted shares have valued the social network below that level. We're told deliberations around the timing and pricing of an IPO are ongoing. FTX is unloading crypto assets and hoarding cash as bankruptcy advisors look to repay customers whose accounts have been frozen since the platform collapsed. The group nearly doubled its cash pile at the end of 2023 to $4.4 billion. FTX has said it's exploring options to potentially restart its crypto exchange. Annabelle. Well, sources say the U.S. is aiming to announce major chip grants by the end of March. They're aimed at supercharging domestic production. The awards are slated to go to Intel and other U.S. chip makers, as well as foreign firms like TSMC and Samsung. This is to help them build factories in the U.S. Money from a $39 billion bill that President Biden signed into law more than a year ago has been slow to trickle out, with only two small grants announced so far. Intel's CEO, meanwhile, is trying to reassure investors that the company's on track to make a comeback. First quarter sales and profit forecasts fell well short of Wall Street estimates, sending shares tumbling the most in more than three years. But Pat Gelsinger told us that the market reaction went too far. First, we finished a great year. We had Q4, a beat on top and bottom line, finishing a year that was comfortably ahead, you know, and showing the transformation uh, journey that we're on. And we believe we're putting points on the board for a long-term transformation of this iconic uh, company. In light of that, hey, the Q1, you know, at the low end of seasonal. So we think the market reaction is a bit overstated in that respect. We understand it, but our company, our employees are doing an incredible job Job at delivering our process technology, restoring product uh, leadership, defining new categories like the AIPC. We're on a multi-year journey and we're not going to be judged on a 90-day shot clock. We are out to rebuild this company and we had a great 23 and I'm confident in a great 24 for this company. Pat, there were, there were so many questions on the call about your foundry business. And for our global audience, that's the co sort of contract manufacturing business where you make chips for others. And, and, and I'm, you seem to say that you didn't get an, as many committed dollars as you thought you might. And I wonder what's standing in the way of that, customers committing to backing your foundry business. Yeah, and we're very comfortable with the progress. You know, we said that we'd have one on our leading edge node 18A, as it's called, and we delivered four for the year. We also found that there was a lot of momentum in our uh, packaging uh, business where we now have five major customers on our advanced packaging uh, technology. And we said, hey, <laughs> we went from $4 billion to over $10 billion of lifetime deal value. So good momentum. But most importantly is the process technology itself. Are we back to a leadership technology? And we're hitting all the milestones, this audacious five nodes and four-year plan. And all of the milestones are on track to have us back to process leadership in 25. And as I say, a foundry company, they want to know that if they design on us, they can build the best products and we're gaining momentum in uh, delivering on exactly that promise. And so proud of my teams for delivering on such an audacious plan. We're on track. What about track for AI accelerators? Not just AI on the PC, but I, I put it bluntly, Pat, NVIDIA's run away with this. When or can you regain any sort of leadership in that space? Yeah, and clearly that's been an area of strength for them. We appreciate that they've, as I say, focused on that for many years and uh, the market has come their way in a strong way. But our roadmap is gaining momentum. Gaudi too, we said we're seeing a significant expansion in the customer pipeline uh, that we have. We're ramping up supply. So I'll say we're chasing to have enough supply you know, to meet market. And we're well underway on our next generation, Gaudi 3, uh, as it's called, with 4X the compute, 2X the network in the lab, 
camp, gaining, uh, you know, really, really good uh, early debug in uh, bringing that product to market later this year. So we feel like, hey, you know, yes, you know, we have a lot of work to do here, but the momentum is building, the market is looking for alternatives, and our roadmap is strengthening as we go through the year. But more importantly, Carolyn, is this idea that last year was the year of high-end training. Mm -hmm. This year, it's about how do I use those models? And that's much more about the enterprise strength where Intel is at the edge, in the PC, and in the enterprise data center. So we see the market coming our way in AI in 24 and 25. That's Intel CEO Pat Gelsing is speaking to Bloomberg Technologies' Ed Ludlow and Caroline Hyde. The coverage continues on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. We're counting down to the market opens in mainland China and Hong Kong as mainland regulators halt the lending of certain shares for short selling. The move is part of measures to support slumping stock markets. Our MLive contributor Garfield Reynolds joins us now for more. So Garfield, another measure, partial ban on short selling, is it going to work? Uh, well Paul, the expectation is that it will you know, lead to some gains or, or certainly you know, limit declines uh, you know, at a time where the government and the regulators, they keep on coming up you know, sort of day after day with fresh you know, efforts to push home the message that Chinese stocks should stop falling. Now, what so far is lacking in a lot of ways is, this is what investors are saying, is they're still pretty concerned about where the Chinese economy is going. Until the Chinese economy turns around, it becomes that much harder to really pile in. And you, you run the danger that every time you boost the market a little bit, you give people who wanted to get out a better point for them to exit because they're reducing their losses or maybe even they're breaking even or getting a little bit of profit and saying, okay, let's get out of here now. So the, the question is, can they buy themselves the time until you get a turnaround in economic data? And one of the things everybody's looking very much to on that front is we get China PMIs on uh, on Wednesday at the end of this month and see if, I mean, they're still expected to show contraction, but see if that contraction is easing or if there are some signs within the data that there is the potential for a turnaround. All right, that was our MLive contributor, Garfield Reynolds. And of course, the focus really on this Hong Kong court hearing that's due to begin in just over half an hour's time from now. Uh, it's going to be focusing on Evergrande. It's this winding up petition. And ahead of that, it was that key watch on how Evergrande was proceeding with debt restructuring talks with key creditors. Now we've just got a report coming out from the Wall Street, Gen uh, Wall Street Journal, rather, and they're saying that Evergrande, the key creditors, could not agree on a restructuring plan. And and so they're saying that they're going to be supporting the creditor's liquidation at the hearing. Again, just to reiterate, Evergrande and its creditors, that focus on whether they could agree to some sort of restructuring. We're hearing that those talks have broken down. So that big watch. We're going back to those live pictures of that Hong Kong court where that hearing is scheduled to take place in just over half an hour's time. More coverage on that just ahead.